be facing. So you've looked at the um, scope of the investigation. Uh, you have realized that there may be significant fines out there, and then you may want to think about ways to consider the reducing the sanctions. And um, I spoke about immunity that, that is uh, very often granted to those who come in first, leniency, perhaps even up to 50% for the second. Um, the third one usually gets less, um, maybe up to 30% as a sort of very rough guideline that, that applies in many jurisdictions. And, and subsequent uh, leniency applicants uh, sort of get, get even lower reductions of their fine. They also face uh, a more significant hurdle, and that is, in many um, uh, jurisdictions, the requirement to not just add further volume to the information available, um, but also add value. Um, and and uh, sort of especially for uh, those leniency applicants further down the line, it becomes increasingly difficult to really add value to the investigation. Uh, and so you may realize that when you're in too late, um, you, you have exposed yourself, uh, you have basically admitted to participating uh, in the cartel, and you may actually not be in a position where you get an effective reduction of the fine. Um, so it means you need to move quickly, uh, but you also sort of need to move cautiously and, and consider whether if you can't move quickly enough, you actually do want to cooperate in the first place. Um, part of that equation is the question of what is available to you. Um, you may be uh, willing to cooperate. Um, uh, you may be there early, but you may be in a situation where you don't actually have anything to contribute, either because uh, the authority in its dawn rate already took what was available to the company, um, or uh, because uh, it maybe internally you are not supported uh, by, by employees uh, to the extent possible. So you realize there may be situations where you could contribute, but you don't actually get to um, the, uh, the information that, that might be available to you. And you need to understand in this context that uh, employees, when they're faced with this, situation of an ongoing investigation, it's, it's, sometimes it's traumatic, sometimes there's police involved, sometimes there's police coming to their homes, um, and, and they're scared, uh, and they're, they're frightened, and they may not be willing to actually sort of reveal everything. Very often they, they adopt a very defensive attitude, uh, and uh, unfortunately I've, I've seen this in the past, people simply lying to your face, you know. Uh, so you need to make them understand what's in it for them, and you need to make them feel comfortable with uh, supporting the investigation. That may not be easy, especially when they have broken internal rules um, uh, by entering into cartels, and it's a difficult balancing act that you need to do, and one that you need to do very quickly too. So, you know, think about these things. Think about... How, what you can do, whether you can go for leniency, and if leniency is still available, whether you can actually effectively go for leniency, and how you get the whole team in, in your organization to actually support that effort. Even if you can cooperate, there's always a cost associated with cooperation as well, um, and you should consider those as well. Um, the cost of cooperating with the authority includes, of course, costs for outside counsel, possibly costs for economists who you want to involve um, in the, and whom you may need to involve in, 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 the, in the course of your events. Um, those costs will usually sort of be incurred anyway, whether you cooperate or not, um, because you need defense counsel. Um, but they're costs, and they're costs to be taken into account. Um, Another, perhaps more important point when devising your antitrust strategy is the question of what are the, event, the, uh, the effects of the almost certain follow-on litigation that will 
uh, occur either in your sort of initial jurisdictions or may occur in other jurisdictions. Um, there's been a lot of forum shopping, uh, even in, in Europe uh, in the recent past, um, and uh, it's sort of people are trying to find the jurisdictions that will allow them to uh, sort of recover perceived damages most effectively. So that's something to take into account, and also to take into account when you think about uh, cooperating or not. Will your leniency application be made available to third parties who uh, sort of claim damages? Will the authority try to protect this? And we're currently seeing uh, sort of a bit of a struggle uh, in, in the European Union. Um, the, uh, the European Court of Justice uh, a couple of days ago uh, sort of uh, had preliminary ruling on that point. Um, and uh, sort of sent a matter back to the German Supreme Court saying, well, actually, it's up to national procedural laws to determine um, whether uh, agency documents can be made available to uh, claimants, damage claimants or not. Of course, taking into account uh, sort of the, the interests of uh, competition uh, law and um, of competition authorities to effectively uh, run investigations. Um, but but it's so the jury is still out. There's other cases uh, pending before the the ECJ um, currently that concern access to Commission European Commission documents. Um, we might have more clarity on that point in in the near future. But it's a complex situation, and you need to take it into account when you actually consider how to respond to an agency investigation follow-on litigation will be an issue you cannot ignore. Um, and that actually brings me the, to, to the next point. Um, something to uh, remember when you go for leniency is that you expose yourself um, to, not just to the authority, but potentially to other parties. Um, in the U.S., uh, immunity applicants, uh, at any rate, have a duty, actually, to cooperate uh, with uh, damage claimants. So as a cartel member, you need to actually support those claims in a civil court. Um, in Europe, that uh, is not yet the case. Um, but uh, you are sort of the most, uh, ultimately the most visible person uh, around. And given that in cartel uh, matters, uh, the liability of the cartel members is usually um, jointly and severally, be, severally liable, uh, it means that uh, even the whistleblower can be exposed in civil actions as the most likely target for claims for damages, not just for the damages the company itself uh, caused, but for damages caused by other cartel members. And so you can easily see how that actually may multiply your, your uh, sort of overall financial exposure. And ultimately, I think that's, that's what sort of many uh, companies are seeing. Even if they would like to cooperate in an agency investigation, they may think twice about it when they take into account and factor into account, uh, in, into the equation, uh, the, the, the costs of uh, potential litigation. Okay, so you've made this uh, wonderful calculation of risks, uh, civil and, and uh, uh, sort of administrative, the likelihood of things uh, sort of going one way or the other in many jurisdictions. Um, and on that basis, you then need to actually develop an antitrust strategy. First of all, think about your general sort of policy. Does the company actually have uh, a policy of always cooperating everywhere it can? In that case, it's fairly easy and straightforward. Um, you, you then just follow the guidelines. If, there's not, if it's not, you still need to actually develop sort of a list of priorities, but you, you can, you, the, the decision whether to cooperate, whether to go in or not, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, if you don't have that sort of policy or a policy that's not as firm as that, you need to actually sort of find out for each jurisdiction what the options are, what the costs are, 
um, and whether you will, in that particular jurisdiction, be able uh, to effectively implement either of the options that are available. You then have sort of a number of country-specific results, which you merge into sort of a final global assessment. What are the total costs of benefits um, associated with cooperation? And you may realize that even though the, the benefits in, in country A far outweigh the costs of cooperating, if you factor that into the overall equation, um, you may still be reluctant to do it and to pursue cooperation in that country because overall that would be inconsistent with your strategy and in other jurisdictions you may not be able to do the same thing. Um, so so the, the, the final step actually is important in a multi-jurisdictional um, investigation. It is not, of course, if you're only facing a single jurisdiction investigation. And... The final step in developing that sort of um, a strategy um, is to consider whether you would be um, able to um, effectively implement your strategy. That brings me to the final uh, point. Regardless of what you're going to do, you will need to prioritize and you need uh, to realize um, that you can't do everything everywhere at once. You need to have a plan, and you need to have priorities. Um, you need to have a plan because in a multi-jurisdictional context, things become very complex very quickly, um, and you actually you need to stay very focused um, to, to implement and your, your options most effectively. It's easy to lose sight uh, in the heat of the battle. So you need to actually have a plan and you need to have someone who is very much focused on that plan and seeing that whatever you choose to do, you do it effectively and consistently. And ultimately, you need to prioritize which are the jurisdictions uh, where your exposure is uh, the biggest, where, which are the jurisdictions where your ability to reduce that exposure um, are the biggest. Which are the jurisdictions where your competitors may be most likely to move first? Um, and which are the jurisdictions which may be less at risk? Where will follow-on action occur? Um, and um, ultimately, what uh, sort of is the risk of enforcement, of pra uh, practically enforcing uh, the sanctions that may be um, uh, imposed? So sort of a very complex assessment one that needs to be done very quickly and very early on in the process. And that actually sort of is perhaps the big message. Uh, Multi-jurisdictional investigations are sort of a huge management uh, task. They're not just sort of a legal uh, task, but they, they challenge the legal team and the management of the company uh, uh, quite significantly get to get a grip on the investigation and to whatever your legal options are, actually sort of implement them effectively. So the key message is think quickly, act sort of decisively, and have the resources that it takes to do what you can do. You know, this is not going to be easy. It's, it's going to be sort of actually very painful, uh, at least sort of during the initial stage. Management will be detracted. People will not like this. But it's, you must treat it really as sort of a, um, a, a major project which will have a significant financial impact on the ultimate performance of the company. And I think that's, that's sort of the, the key message when you're looking at multi-jurisdictional investigations. Uh, it's, it, it must be treated as sort of a project that has commercial priority. And everyone in the team, legal and uh, sort of management uh, teams, must understand this if you want to actually sort of have a chance of dealing with this effectively. Thank you. Okay. 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 If, there, if there's any questions right now, Otherwise, I'd say sort of Gabor take over, and, and we'll, we'll have a discussion at the end.